of the children's ministries. This morning we are beginning a new series, and uh, this is our Advent series, and this is, uh, we get a little bit of extra time since Thanksgiving came a little bit earlier in the calendar uh, this year. But I will say that as we begin this new series, that this isn't a normal nativity story series, uh, but it is a story that paves the way for Jesus' entry into this world, and I'll explain a little bit about this later. But I believe as we go into the book of Ruth that God is going to show us some incredibly important things about himself. So if you have your Bible, if you would take it out to the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, right after Judges, Ruth chapter 1, and I'm going to just read the first five verses this morning, and then we're going to plow through a lot of the first chapter together as we go. Ruth chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, says this, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, and they were Epaphrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took, two, these took Moabite wives, the name of one was Orpah, and the other name was, of the other was Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Melhon and Chilon died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband." Let's pray once again as we begin uh, this series together. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. We pray that as we jump into this new series by your Holy Spirit, that you would teach us and grow us and grip us by your grace. Lord, I pray that you would minister your life and bring hope and healing to the, all of us here this morning. We ask this and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You know, I've always been a fan of Route 66. Uh, it's been called uh, the Mother Road, a winding from Chicago to L.A. And for many decades, uh, before the interstate highway system was built in the mid-50s, most people traveled this road to the west, uh, either for vacation or even to discover a new life out west. And uh, truly, Route 66 is part of our American history, and I absolutely love everything about it. Uh, over the years, it's been the subject of many different songs and movies and television shows even. Uh, today, there's been a resurgence of nostalgia uh, among many who want to ride in their classic car or motorcycle or take their fifth wheel across that highway uh, you can, if you've traveled on it, you can see museums regularly, diners, and roadside attractions that really still dot this highway. Actually, earlier this year when I was out in California, uh, in South Pasadena, I stopped at the Fair Oaks Pharmacy. Uh, and it, it's a great spot to get a great malt, and I had one, it was just phenomenal. But that place is over 100 years old, but it's, again, on this Route 66, and there's 101, or there's tons of these kind of joints along the way from Chicago to L.A. Route 66 is loaded with history. You know, it's interesting, as we talk about another road this morning and throughout this series, we also see that the road to Bethlehem is also a road that is filled with history. Now, most of us, when we think of the road to Bethlehem, we immediately think of Mary and Joseph on that journey to that small village that, where they would have to register for the census and for paying taxes, and which ultimately led to Christ's birth in, the, in that stable. It was a hard journey, especially as Mary was due a child uh, very quickly, and, and this was a journey of obligation for them as they had to register back in their hometown Yet it was also a journey of prophetic fulfillment. But you know, as we think about this road to Bethlehem, I want to take us further back into history along that road and tell the story of something that had a profound effect on the story of Advent. In many ways, what we're going to talk about in this series 
shaped human history. And so we're going to talk about this story of a woman by the name of Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. Now it mentions here in verse 1 of the passage that we read here, it says, in the days when the judges ruled. So we have to understand a little bit of the context of this story, that it took place during the period of history referred in the Bible as the judges. This was about a 300-year-old history in Israel where there was no king, and it says that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Uh, There were moments throughout those 300 years of obedience as they would listen to a godly judge, but whenever the judge would pass away, often they would return back to their rebellious ways and God would bring about his judgment once again. And it's interesting, according to what is going on in this story, it says that there was famine in in those days, in the days of Ruth and Naomi. There was a famine in that time, and we can assume that was likely a result of God's judgment for Israel's rebellion against him. So this was a time of decline. This was a time of decay. And this was largely the result of God's judging Israel for her rebellion against his ways. And it says here in this story, we're introduced to a particular man by the name of Elimelech and his wife Naomi. And it says that they lived in the village of Bethlehem, But the famine was so severe at that time that he decided to leave for the country of Moab. Just to give us a little bit of an understanding of of the Moabites, you'll see the map there on your screen. It's located to the southern part or southeast side of the Dead Sea. That they were descendants of Lot's incestuous relationship with his firstborn daughter, we see in Genesis chapter 19, and the aftermath of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so the Moabites uh, lived in the highlands in the eastern side of that Dead Sea. Uh, if, uh, if, you'll, if you're in your Bibles, or you'll see again in the screen, Deuteronomy chapter 23 uh, gives us a little bit of an insight into the Moabites themselves. Deuteronomy 23, I'll have to wait a second until I can find it here. Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 through 6 says this. No Ammonite nor, or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and with water on the way when you came up out of Egypt, because they had hired against you Balaam, the son of Baal from Pethor, or Mesopotamia, to curse you. But the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam. Instead, the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you, because the Lord your God loved you. You shall not seek their peace or their prosperity all your days forever. So what the Lord was saying here in the book of Deuteronomy is that even to the 10th generation, the Moabites were not permitted to enter into the congregation of the Lord because, as we see in that story we just read, of their lack of hospitality to the Israelites as they were leaving Egypt. As the Jews were wandering there, they were coming out of Egypt and going through the wilderness, the Moabites would not help. And so by Judges, and by this time that is written, ten generations may indeed have passed from the time of the Exodus. But the point was, is that the Moabites were seen largely as the enemies of Israel. We have to understand that reality regarding the context of of this situation. They did not worship God, and actually according to chapter 11, verse 33, they worshiped a God God called Chemosh, C-H-E-M-O-S-H, Chemosh. They worshiped him, and this pagan God demanded child sacrifice. So this was regularly a part of the Moabite cultish kind of worship to their pagan God. And so Elimelech, Like Abraham before him, rather than trusting God in the difficulty of his circumstances as they were experiencing famine in Bethlehem, he set off for a distant land. You could say rather than staying in the promised land, he charted his own course. And similar to Abraham's leaving and decision to leave for Egypt, Elimelech's decision would be a big mistake. 
fact, as we're going to see, it was quite tragic for he and the family. So Elimelech and Naomi settled in Moab for a long time. It mentions specifically 10 years. And so they had two sons as they went into this particular region. And during those 10 years, these two sons married wives from Moab. And it, it appears from everything that we read here, the very little we see about Elimelech, is that he had no intentions of leaving Moab. During that time, it was, a, it was a time where he decided to stay there. Now, you could say that going to Moab was a big mistake for several reasons for him. First of all, Limelech, because of his temporary situation, turned his back on his inheritance, as he would have that in Bethlehem, and he left it all behind, including all of the, his land, and set off for this nation outside the promised land. That's his first mistake. He left everything behind because of a temporal situation. But the second reason is because he perhaps was trying to flee God's chastisement of Israel during their time of rebellion. He was trying to get away with it. Yes, their famine was largely, we can assume, a result of their sin. Maybe he would have been better off to stick with the people of God in Bethlehem under judgment than to go off into this distant land of Moab, where there was pagan worship. You know, in Moab, they did find food, but the price they had to pay was not what they expected. It mentions here in this opening few verses that during those 10 years, Elimelech himself, he died, as well as his two sons. Even though they tried to escape God's judgment in Bethlehem, God's judgment came. And the family line was blotted out. And so we're left here with Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, Opa and, uh, and Ruth. And so the, she's there with her two daughters, and she's trying to pick up the pieces of her life. She's grieving, naturally. Paul Heaton said this way, When one goes to Moab, leaving it is more difficult than the trip there. Many a saint has gone to Moab for temporal relief, only to remain there and die broken and empty. You could say, friends, that Elimelech is the type of prodigal son that never returned home. He died there, out of the promised land. And as I mentioned, Naomi's condition is utter grief. You know, in a a few short verses here, death wipes the men off the scene here, leaving three grieving widows behind. And so Naomi, think of it this way, Naomi was in a distant land far away from her Jewish roots. She had no land or real possessions, no place in society, nor any source of income. She had no male heir left, and both of her son's wives were barren. And so you could say that her insurance coverage for the future was gone. She didn't have anything. And against You could say the backdrop of an ancient patriarchal culture, that was a big deal. She didn't have anything. No one to carry on the family name or care for her in her old age. You could make the case this morning that Naomi is the female equivalent to Job. It's ironic that uh, Naomi, her name means pleasant, but all she knows here in Moab is bitterness. And the book, actually, of Ruth is told from Naomi's point of view. That's something to consider as we go throughout this series. And, you know, it's sad that we often see Naomi as a bitter and complaining old woman. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of parallels between Ruth, or I should say Naomi and Job. There's a lot of parallels. Think about Naomi and Job. They both are counting their losses, They both are living in agony and bewilderment. They are both wrestling with God. And even their laments are strikingly similar. In some ways, thinking about God only made things worse for both Job and Naomi. Carolyn Custis James says it this way. She says, I think Naomi actually out-Jobed Job. Both tragically lose their families and their life they work to build, But Job isn't alone. He still has a wife and a community to surround him, such as they are. 
Job is not an immigrant, and he's not a woman. Yet historically, we have wept with Job, and we criticize Naomi. Why? Can't we weep with Naomi as well? And the truth is, there's a little bit of Naomi in all of us. Grief. You know, Naomi is just trying to pick up the pieces of her life again. In many ways, she feels that her life is all over. Everything is dead and gone. Her hope for the future is gone. And she's asking big questions like, God, where are you? And she's, she's truly struggling with God. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there this morning. You're grieving. You're confused. You're trying to pick up the pieces of your life. You're looking at God from ground zero. The truth is, when the full force of suffering hits us in our pain, no matter how long we've been walking with God or how much the theology that perhaps we've mastered, our faith can take an awful beating, can it? You know, it's interesting, as we see in verses 6 and 7, Naomi makes an important decision. Look in verse 6. It says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. So as we see here in this story, Naomi, Naomi had heard of how things were good once again in Bethlehem, or in the land of Judah, that God was visiting his people, and that the food was plentiful. And so she's thinking, let's take the long road back to Judah. Let's go back home again to Bethlehem. Now, I want to make something very clear. We're not sure of the exact route that they took. We don't know specifically where they settled in Moab. They could have taken a route below the Dead Sea or above the Dead Sea. And so we could probably assume it wasn't the exact road that Mary and Joseph would later take. But it was a road nonetheless. It would have taken at least four to six days, perhaps even longer, to go from Moab, depending on where they were located, all the way back to Bethlehem. And it would have been a very rugged journey. I mean, there are mountains on both sides of the Dead Sea, and they would have to travel from very high places. Actually, the Dead Sea is the lowest place on earth, so they're having to go down, then way back up. So it was a rugged and difficult journey. You know, it's interesting, as they begin this journey to return back to Judah and to Bethlehem, I'm sure there were some thoughts that plagued Naomi's mind. She's probably thinking, I shouldn't be taking these girls away from their homeland. I need to make things right. And we have to remember that, that Ruth and or Orpah were Moabites. This was the land that they knew. This, they didn't know anything about Judah or Bethlehem. They didn't know anything about that region. This wasn't their home at all. And so Naomi's probably conflicted. She's thinking, I need to go back, but why should I obligate my daughters-in-law to come with them? They need to stay home. And so she has a heart-to-heart -heart talk with them. Let's pick up once again in verses 8 and 9. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and me. The, the Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. So she has this heart-to-heart -heart conversation along this road. As they were going back to Bethlehem or Judah, she stops and she has this conversation. It's an interesting conversation that ensues. We see a little bit more about it in 10 through 13. It says, and they said to her, no, we will not return with you to your people. But Naomi, or I should say, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. 
So Naomi hears in this conversation along this road, she's trying to talk some sense back into her daughters-in-laws. There's, look, girls, there's nothing for you in Bethlehem. Turn back and find husbands in your own homeland. Have a family and stay there. You could say that Naomi is being a realist here. She's saying, look, girls, you need to head back to where you are familiar with, where you have family, stay there. Because if, if you're coming with me, you're probably going to be cursed anyways. My life is bitter. And we, we, we get a little glimpse here of Naomi's heart. She truly felt that God was against her. She was bitter. She felt that everything was going against her, that God was punishing her. But then there comes a pivotal decision, not just in this story, but in human history. Look in verse 14. And they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Orpah decides naturally to go back home. I mean, can we really blame her? This was all that she was familiar with. She had family there. There was nothing in, in Bethlehem or Judah, one would presume, that would be there. And after all, Naomi was having a run of bad luck after a while. I mean, why should I go with her? I mean, Naomi appears to be making some sense here. But what is so devastating about Orpah's decision is that she was once again returning to the land of idolatry. And sadly, history never tells us what happened to Orpah. It was a fateful decision. But Ruth, by contrast, clung to Naomi. And this was actually quite a radical choice. Look what happens in verses 15 through 17. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or return from following you, for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. It's interesting. Ruth here makes a profound confession. You could say that in the middle of her own personal grief after losing her own husband, in the middle of her own confusion, while on that dusty road, probably out in the middle of nowhere, she makes a decision. She makes a choice. I will go with you, Naomi. I will stay where you stay, and I will make Bethlehem my new home, away from my own people. And I will worship the God of Israel. I'm going to stay with you, Naomi, and I, I, I'm going to actually take care of you unto death. I'm going to care for you. Now, this is a huge confession on Ruth's part. She is essentially right here converting to Judaism. This is a big decision. This, and she's also making a type of vow before the Lord and before Naomi. And, and, and you could say that, that Ruth is the surprising gutsy risk taker, the one who is willing to discard cultural protocol, even her own hopes for happiness, and bind herself to her mother-in-law. Carolyn Custis James says this, in a, one pivotal moment, Ruth's identity and center of gravity changed forever. The rest of her story is a stunning and at some times shocking chronicle of her efforts to live out what it means to be Yahweh's child. You see, Klaus, at its core, this choice really wasn't about geography. It wasn't about family or loyalty or even about the future. This was a decision about God. She will trust the God of Israel. And Ruth made up in her mind what she was going to do. Look in verse 18. It says, And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. She saw Ruth's determination that I'm going to do this. I'm going to stick with you. 
I'm going to vow before God that I'm going to worship Him and I'm going to stick with you, Naomi, no matter what life may bring us. You know, friends, while it may appear that this long road back to Bethlehem, particularly for Mary and Joseph, was a road of obligation, you could say that the road for Ruth was a place of decision. The place of decision. Which way will I go? Life has been hard. I've had blow after blow. And I have nothing in my life right now to really look forward to. Maybe you're, here, maybe you're at that place right now. Maybe you, so to speak, are on this same road. It's a trail of tears. A trail that's painful. Where life has not been, it appears fair. Where you have hurt, you have grief. And you seem that everything is now behind you as far as the happy days. And it doesn't look like there's much ahead. But it's interesting is Ruth made this decision, I'm going to trust God in the middle of my grief, that we need to make that same decision as well. I'm going to trust God even though I don't know the answers, even if I don't know the future, even if I have to cry myself to sleep at night, I'm still going to trust God even at times when I don't feel like it. It's interesting, Ruth decided not to trust in her old pagan ways, but she trusted in the God of Israel. It's interesting that there is a sense of duty that she has to her mother-in-law, but I don't really think that fully was what was motivating her. I believe also she's motivated by worship, that while she sees nothing that would convey to her that this God is a God worth worshiping, she decides to make this choice on this journey, on this long roadway, that I'm going to worship God. I'm going to trust Him. I'm going to put my confidence in, in Him. And while I don't understand the God, Naomi, that you are talking about, the fact that right now has made you quite bitter, nonetheless, I choose to follow Him. And so she clings to Naomi and turns her face towards Bethlehem. She clings to Naomi and turns her face towards Bethlehem. In other words, she's willing to walk with bitterness, even on her journey of faith, and learn to worship the true God. Boy, there's some great lessons in that, isn't there? Learning to worship God even in the grief. You know, somewhere along this road, you could say that God closed in on Ruth. Like Abraham, she left her homeland and family for an unknown family. And what her dis- makes her decision even more radical, that she didn't have any promise of gr- God's great blessing along the way. No stars in the sky to look at. Abraham at least had the stars and God promised him. That she didn't have any of that. You could say that Ruth's face was probably even more significant than Abraham's. This is radical. You could say that Ruth gives one of the strongest examples in all of Scripture of faith in action. She leaves her homeland, and she never looks back. My friend, are you on this long road today? The road of suffering, the road of confusion, this trail of tears. Maybe you're not today. Maybe you've been there over the last few years, but you feel like you're coming out. I don't know where you're at today. But if you are on this road, you need to make the decision like Ruth to trust in God, to trust in Him. I want to read Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. This is an interesting and important Thing that is mentioned here. Luke chapter 9, verse 57 says this. As they were going along the road, someone go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. 
And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You might ask, well, say, you said, Pastor Tim, the story of Ruth affects all of human history. How, where are you getting that from? And more particularly, where, how does it affect the Christmas story? Well, as we're going to see as we go through this book together, Ruth will eventually become the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus, as we see in the genealogy in Matthew and Luke's Gospels. And this decision by Ruth to go with her mother-in-law to Bethlehem really shaped Messianic history. You know, you could say that Ruth from Moab made possible the coming of Christ to Bethlehem. Clayhouse, I believe this morning that some of you as well need to make this decision. Make a decision in your life. Which way will I go? Maybe you're in a place right now where you've experienced bitterness and you're in a place of great pain. Or you see all, all you see around you is chaos. We can learn from Ruth's example to say, you know, I'm going to trust God even on this bitter road. I'm going to make a decision. Yes, life hurts. Bad things do happen and things are not easy. But I'm going to choose to worship God even if I have to walk in my grief. And you know, what's interesting here, friends, is that this, impli- this, this decision that she made had implications for other people. It had implications for human history. Just, just as Ruth's right decision affected her legacy forever, perhaps your decision will affect your legacy and the legacy of those who follow you. Your decisions today will potentially affect your friends and your family. You know, it's interesting, the name Ruth in Hebrew means compassionate friend, but it's also interesting that the root word also means feed a flock. In other words, her her life had impact on others. Now, she didn't see it there on that dusty road, but the decisions she made that day on that long road back to Bethlehem would feed others. And frankly, as we gather in Christ's name here today, it feeds us. Think about the legacy of your life. You know, as you go to a a cemetery, you'll often see the two dates, and there's a dash between those two dates of the birth and the death. There's a lot in that dash, isn't there? fleeting it is. Some of you that are older think, boy, it just goes by in a flash. It does. But what we leave behind is a legacy. The question is, will we leave behind a legacy of bitterness? Will we stay on that road and potentially even turn back like Orpah did and go back and say, you know, forget God? Or will we make the choice, not just for ourselves, but for our family and friends or those future generations to make an impact, to feed the flock into the future. You know, this Christmas season, God is calling you and me to make a decision to worship Him, to make the choice. And let me say this very clearly. Yes, we all want to have those warm, fuzzy feelings and you know, feel excited about it, but there are times along this journey when it's not all fuzzy feelings. There are times along this journey when you don't feel like worshiping. But you have to make the choice. You have to choose to trust in God despite the tears. And Ruth did that. And so as we come in, even to this Advent season, for some of us, this is the joyous time of the year and we love the celebrations and the lights. We don't like the traffic and the shopping and all the craziness. There. But we, we, maybe we like the shopping, but we, there's parts of things we do and don't like about Christmas time. But for some of us here today, this season is a time of grief because we remember those that have gone on. We remember perhaps the things we used to have, but we have no longer. Can we make the choice to worship God sometimes in the middle of a mess? 
God is calling us to make this decision on this long road back to Bethlehem. And our faithfulness to him will inevitably feed others. You know, over the next few weeks, we're going to take that long road back to Bethlehem. But I'm going to close, as the worship team comes forward, I'm going to close with a quote by George Gardiner. He said, The story of Ruth is the story of a God who is not frustrated by the failure of an instrument or the poor quality of the material with which he has to work. He continues to work out the details of his plan, even in the worst of circumstances. I'm going to just invite you to stand at this time. Maybe you're on this road, so to speak. Maybe this Advent season you've been... The invitation is for us to make the choice. Maybe despite our feelings, say, God, I'm going to trust in you. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are a God that we can depend on. And Lord, there are times that we simply don't know your ways. That your ways are higher than our own. And your ways are really past our finding out. But God, we make the choice, even here today, to worship you. And like Ruth, we will trust in you. And we're going to walk the road that you have for us, the trail that you have blazed and marked before us, and the confidence to know that you're working in ways we cannot see, and you're working things out for our good and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Confession or a way of declaring what we believe. And maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know, I, I need to just get back to this place of decision. I need to get back to this road and getting going.